as we shouted and screamed from the mountaintops, as we tell it to the masses, hallelujah, we will shout out, hallelujah, we will cry out that He is God. Lord, when we come to know who you are, it blows us away that you, your love, your mercy, your grace, you are God. You are God of the universe. You created everything. You desire for us to walk with you, to reflect your glory, and you are God. You are love. Yes. You are mercy. Yes. You are justice. Thank you. you are so great, Lord. Yes. 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 And when we come to know who you are, when we come to know who the God of the universe is, we can't help but shout it from the mountaintops. We can't help but scream it to the masses. Thank you, Lord. You are God, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your love, your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy endures. And yes, your justice endures, but your justice is wrapped up in your love. It's wrapped up in your mercy. And you are a God who cares about every single hair on our head. Amen. Thank you, Lord. How can we deserve such a good God? But you are there for us. And we give thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am going to no, go back to prayer. I am going to uh, actually we're finished with the prayer, haven't we? All right, go go on to the uh, go on to the scripture. All right, Mike. My bad. I'm uh, going to read to you from Isaiah 40. Uh, verses 21 through 31. And if actually you can see that in Tim Do Tim Taylor's eye black there. But uh, we'll go to the scripture now. And I'm actually going to be reading from a different uh, <coughs> version than the one we usually read from. Is it up there? Do we have this? Yeah, there it is. Uh, that's today's New International Version. I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, I think it's, we're just a little more familiar with the words the way the New Revised Standard Version says it. It often mean the same thing, but I think the familiarity will help us here. So uh, do your best you can, Mike, in following on with the, the, the different language. These are Isaiah's words. And they're Isaiah's words to the people that were being held captive in Babylon to, the, to the, the, the Israelites that had been captured and carried away into exile. And he says this, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the world? It is He, that meaning God, who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem uh, taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like rubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes on high and see who created these. He's pointing to the stars. He who brings out their host and numbered them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. 
Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary. And all the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. I've got a scratchy throat this morning, so I don't know lose my voice in the middle of preaching. In uh, preparing for today's sermon, I uh, saw a, an, an, an online post that attributed a quote to Abraham Lincoln. And according to this post, uh, Lincoln once said, the problem with quotes on the internet is that you can't be sure of their accuracy. Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I got that right? Yeah. <laughs> and Lincoln got it right, huh? Okay. Um, I've titled my sermon, Misquotes Are Rampant or Subtitled That Every, Everything You Read on the Internet Is True. Not. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, first of all, uh, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but they didn't have the internet in Lincoln's days. Okay? Alright. <laughs> Alright. All right. Um, right. The internet is filled with so many false quotes and misquotes and quotes attributed to somebody who never ever said them. Uh, Quotes that are taken out of context to put into somebody's mouth and, 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 and he really meant or she meant it in a total different way than it's attributed to them because it's taken out of context. And sometimes these errors get repeated over and over again that we begin to think that these errors are true. Mark Twain is attributed with saying, Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that quote is also attributed to Jack Benny and Muhammad Ali, and the fact of the matter is none of them said that. It originated with an anonymous government researcher who happened to put it in a paper that got on the Internet. And that's where the quote originally comes from. Sometimes the quotes are attributed to uh, someone who never ever even uttered these words. Albert Einstein is quoted as having said, uh, two things are absolutely infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. There's no evidence that Albert Einstein actually said that. Uh, the, the only place we have is, is a psychiatrist, Frederick Pearls. He said, Einstein said that. But we have no evidence any place else that he actually oh, said oh, that. Oh, Everything okay over here? Yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, I want us to play a game right now, okay? Um, I'm going to share a famous quote with you. And I want you to tell me where you think this quote uh, uh, came from or maybe who said it. All right, here's, here's the first one. You'll get this one. Beam me up, Scotty. Star Trek. Star Trek. Okay. All right. Actually, these words were never, ever uttered 
on any Star Trek episode on TV. Captain Kirk and Spock never said these words. They said things like, you know, energize and beam me aboard and two to beam up. But not one of them ever said beam me up, Scott. All right, I got another one for you. Okay. Uh, Elementary, my dear Watson. Who said that? Sherlock Holmes. Well, we attributed that to Sherlock Holmes, but this phrase was never uttered by Sherlock Holmes in any of the novels that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote about Sherlock Holmes. Um, you know, Sherlock Holmes does say, my dear Watson, in these books, but not once does he ever say elementary, my dear Watson. This phrase, uh, the first time it's seen in print was by P.G. Woodhouse, who wrote a book in, it was published in 1909, and it was said by somebody totally different than the Sherlock Holmes character. So, all right, let's get a little more contemporary. Who said, I invented the internet? Uh, <laughs> who said that? One of the vice presidents. Al Gore, okay. <laughs> well, actually this quote is misattributed to Al Gore, it's totally taken out of context from what Al Gore was uh, talking about. The, the vice president was talking about the legislative initiatives that he was able to get through Congress when he was a senator from Tennessee. And what he actually said was, during my service in the United States Congress, I took the initiative in creating the inter internet. I took the initiative in moving forward a whole range of legislative initiatives that have proven to be important to our country's economic growth and environmental protection and improvement in our education system. Uh, he never said, you know, I invented or I created the internet. He never claimed to, to be the scientist or the technical person behind that. What he was claiming was that he helped push that through Congress. But his political foes took it and twisted it to make him look like, you know, he was some egotistical person who, you know, was claiming to invent something that he had never invented. Now, it's unfortunate, but people in this world will misrepresent what is being said. They'll, they'll misrepresent what somebody said or, or, or an issue or a quote to push forward their political, or not even political, their viewpoint. They'll say something to try to get something across because they want their point to be accepted. And they may twist things around a little yes, bit. Yes. Amen. And unfortunately, we also see people doing this with Scripture. Okay, I want to ask you this question. Where in the Bible does it say, God helps those who help themselves? It doesn't. You're right. It never says God helps those who help themselves anywhere in the Bible. Now, I happen to believe there's a lot of truth in that statement. But it's nowhere in Scripture, you know. Uh, it, that is actually an ancient proverb that, that has been in the literature of many, many different cultures. And Benjamin Franklin even wrote it once in Poor Richard's Almanac in 1736. All right, tell me this. Is the statement, no rest for the wicked, biblical? Is the statement, no rest for the wicked, biblical? Well, the actual words come from Isaiah 57, 21. And it says, there is no peace, says God, for the wicked. There's a big difference between rest and peace. <laughs> okay, how about this? Uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, is that in the Bible? Proverbs. Well, there are a whole lot of Proverbs that deal with rearing children and the importance of discipline with children. But the closest to spare the rod, spoil the child comes from Proverbs 13, 24. It says, whoever spares the rod hates their children, 
but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I think there's some similarities yes. between, and they could be interpreted to, to be meaning the same thing, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, spare the rod, spoil the char child, that could be used pretty harshly by somebody just like right that. The, the biblical actual quote to me is enveloped with a little more love and understanding yes. about what it yes. means to raise children than the way it's gotten repeated in our culture. Okay, is money is the root of all evil in the Bible? Is money is the root of all evil in the Bible? Is the love of the Bible? It says in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, I've got the wrong, in 1 Timothy 6.10 it says, for the love, the love of money is the root of all evil. Two different things. Yes. Money can be used for good, yeah. you know, but if you place it above God, if you're loving money more, you know, uh, then then you're going to be driven by by that love of money. All right, how about this? God won't give us more than we can bear. God won't give us more than we can bear. The actual verse in 1 Corinthians 10.13 says that God won't allow us to be tempted beyond our ability to bear. You know, it's not that God is, is you know, uh, uh, you know, it says God, phrases, God won't give us more than we can bear. You know, I mean, and, and you think about that and you think about all of the struggles and the pain and all of that that's coming on us. But the actual phrase is, God won't let us be tempted, be tempted beyond our ability to bear it, and that God will provide a way for us to endure. So, you know, we, um, being tempted and being ability to, to uh, uh, bear the temptation so we don't give in to the temptation. You know, very, very different than thinking about what we might have to bear in this life. Jesus actually tells us to pick up our cross and walk with Him. We have to, if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we're going to have to bear a cross. You know, and Lord knows, I can't bear that by myself. I need not only the support of the church, but I especially need the support of my Lord. Amen. When the crosses that come to me, I have to, have to bear those. Well, to really know God, to really know what God wants for you in your life, you've got to go to the source. You know, too often, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, People speak out of turn. They, they, you know, they say this, they say that, and, and and they're not going to the scripture. They're not grounding themselves in a relationship with God. They're not seeking guidance from their pastor, and they just speak whatever they think is the truth because they heard somebody else say it in the culture. You know, we need to be going to the source, going to, to God's Word, going to our relationship that we have built with God. Today's scripture reading from Isaiah 40, 31. I mean, that's an eminently quotable scripture. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And this quote has been used in many, many different places, in a lot of different contexts, and sometimes yes. it gets used to mean something it didn't mean to begin with. And the reason I put Tim Tebow up there is because he wrote it on his eye black, Isaiah 40, 31. And quite frankly... You know, he had it there when he was winning games at, in college at the University of Florida. And, you know, I think Tim Tebow's reference to Isaiah 40, 31 
had more to do with not getting weary and young men running and not fainting, uh, getting to the end zone, getting to the end zone more than it had to do with what Isaiah was really talking about here. Um, the prophet Isaiah's purpose in writing this scripture is to remind people that of the strength that we have in God. Not the strength to win a game or get to the end zone, but the strength that we have in God, a strength that will sustain us when the whole world seems to be falling apart. You know, have you ever felt like things in your life have just gotten so complicated, things have, you know, really gone in so many different directions that you sometimes feel like there's, there's no hope for any good to happen? You know, uh, the whatever possibility there was for your dreams to, to come true, those possibilities have been destroyed. If you know that feeling, things just totally coming apart, then you know what the people of Judah were feeling at this moment. Why Isaiah wrote what he wrote. Babylon had just invaded Judah. And they, Babylon had come in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. They dismantled all of the institutions of Jewish society. And, and, and anyone who was anybody was carried off into exile. They took the priests and the judges and the scholars and the soldiers and the craftsmen and the artisans and the administrators and the shopkeepers. They were all carried away as slaves because they had skills that Babylon wanted in their area to help build Babylon up. Yes. And there was no one left in Jerusalem to run Jerusalem. The huge number of people that were carried off into exile saw their dreams of a Jerusalem as the city of God totally destroyed. You know, they were forced when they were, were sent into exile to walk 500 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's the short way, but that short way was so difficult with uh, rough terrain and, and desert heat and all that sort of thing that sometimes they took the easier way, but it was 900 miles. And, and, and the, 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 the people of Israel, now they were walking, they were, they were forced to, to, to walk to this strange land, and, and they were now strangers. Strangers in this strange land, they were forced into slavery. They were made to serve others who worshipped gods that, that they had, you know, these strange gods, they had no knowledge of them. There was no hope of ever seeing their homeland again. They were exhausted. They were teetering on complete physical and emotional collapse. Have you ever felt that? Yes. Have you ever felt like you just can't go on? Yeah. Yes. And you wonder why, if there's any purpose in going on mm -hmm. sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming what mm -hmm. spiritual and physical fatigue can do to us. If, 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 if we're spiritually and physically exhausted, sometimes a voice of doubt can creep into yes. our head. And it can tell us, oh, you're no good. Yeah. You know, it can tell you things that are never, ever going to get better. It'll tell you, things, oh, you're an addict, or you're weak, or you'll never amount to anything. You know, you belong on the streets with the dogs. And, and in the midst of Judah's exhaustion, in the midst of our exhaustion, the prophet Isaiah speaks these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, yes. the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Isaiah wants the people to know that God does not give up. You know, God is ever vigilant to save you, His people. Yes. Through the prophet Isaiah, 
God is telling the people that no matter what the future might look like, it is not a meaningless ordeal of suffering. Amen. God has not given up on you. Do not give up on yourself. You know, you may be faint. You may be weary. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. You know? What we need to be asking God to do is what we sang in that uh, one of the opening songs. Teach us, Lord. Yes. Yes. Teach us, Lord, yes. to wait. Yes. And to the pessimist who says, yes. wait, <laughs> wait, I've been doing that all my life. I'll say, no, you haven't. Yes. Because yes. if you had been waiting yes. upon the Lord, you would be able to mount up on wings. Yes. 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 If you had been waiting upon the Lord, you would be able to run and yes. not be weary. If yes. you had been waiting upon the Lord, you yes. would be able to walk yes. and not yes. think. Yes. Those who yes. wait upon the Lord are not hopeless. Amen. Amen. The prophet Isaiah, he's not talking about a passive waiting. He's not talking about a kind of waiting that does nothing and just sits on its laurels, you know, waiting to win the lottery, doing nothing, you know. But, uh, he's not talking about a kind of waiting where you put in no effort and you just hope and expect that something good is going to come your way someday. The kind of waiting he is talking about is an active waiting. The kind of waiting he is talking about is, 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 is a waiting that, that expects God to act. A waiting that has hope in what God is going to do. The kind of waiting he is talking about is like a waiter or a waitress in a restaurant. You know how they come and wait on your table. They come to serve you. The kind of waiting that he's talking about is the kind of waiting that, that serves God's will, that serves God's purposes, that, that, that expectantly ex, you know, is asking the Lord to be involved in their life and, 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 and wants to do what God wants of us. That's the kind of waiting that we're talking about you. This kind of waiting upon the Lord requires your effort. It requires you to seek Amen. His will, yes. uh, to seek it in all that you do, in, in every moment, in every decision that you have in your life, in, in your waking and in your sleeping, in your rising and you're going to bed, seeking God's will yes. at all times. We talk, been talking about this the last couple of weeks. You know, are you anthropocentric or theocentric? Are you centered on humanity or are you centered on God? Do you believe the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand? It, it, if, if you do, then you're going to, uh, to live a life that is turned to God, yes. waiting on God. You know, you're going to repent. You're, you're going to find ways to embrace the ways of God if you are theocentric. To repent means to turn from the world and turn to God. Amen. And if this is what you're doing, then you are embracing God's ways. You are waiting upon the Lord. You are serving God's purposes to reflect God's glory in this world. When you wait upon the Lord... You will hunger to know Him. When you wait upon the Lord, you're going to be so connected because you're waiting upon Him that, that you're going to want to know Him. You're going to want to go deeper. You're going to have that relationship that's going to fill you yes. with just a sense of vibrancy that you somehow connected, connected yes. with something that is so true in this world. And, and you're going to want more of it in your life. Yes. And so you're going to start searching the Scriptures. You're going to spend time in prayer and meditation with God. When you wait upon the Lord, you are going to joyfully join others in worship and praise of God in His sanctuary. Amen. Because when we come together and we wait together, the, the power of the Spirit is even enhanced by our numbers. And we're, we're filled with His presence. You know, when you wait upon the Lord... You're going to come together in covenant with others. 
covenant to account for accountability and support and encouragement. When you wait upon the Lord, you're going to know that we were meant for each other. And we were meant to support one another, yes. hold one another accountable, yes. encourage one another so that we can walk in this world and not be consumed by the world, Amen. but walk in the presence Amen. of God. Amen. And we need each other to do that. You know, we do more than just coming to church and sit in church on a Sunday morning. This is important. You know, but just sitting in church doesn't make you a faithful Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Okay? You know, what, we have to actively engage ourselves in a relationship with the Lord, and we need each other to support us in that walk. And so we have Sunday morning, Sunday school to help us with other people. We're starting up for Lent some. Uh, two, Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday evening, Bible studies. And what we have Bible studies throughout the year in the evening. We've got Celebrate Recovery every Thursday night to help us do that. We've got our United Methodist Men and our United Methodist Women's Group. Yes. These are all small groups that are meant to encourage us and support us and help us walk the walk that God has called us to walk. <coughs> When you wait upon the Lord, you're going to make sure that your words and your actions don't do any harm to anybody. When you wait upon the Lord, you're going to make sure that your words and actions you know, are, are, are doing all the good that they can in this world because that's what God created us to do, to reflect His glory. So if you're waiting on Him, you're going to be filled with His presence and you're going to be doing that good that He wants done in this world. Amen. Amen. Whenever you wait upon the Lord, you are in the presence of the Lord. And whenever you are in the presence of the Lord, you are strengthened and renewed by Him so that you can better reflect His glory. Amen. Amen. Whenever we are in His presence... It's His healing touch. His healing touch comes to us because we are in His presence. And we are remolded and remade to reflect the image in which He originally created us. He created us in the image of God. And that's who He wants us to reflect. So, the world? Well... The world's going to tell you this is the truth and that is the truth and it's going to have a quote here and you're going to find something on the internet and you're going to have friends and co-workers tell you convinced that what they're saying is the gospel truth. But if you're really waiting on the Lord, you're going to be in His presence. You're going to have a sense of who God is because you've gone to the Scriptures You've been supported in the church. You've been in prayer and meditation. And, and, and you're going to be connected. You're going to be connected to the truth because you're connected to God. Amen. 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 Amen.